Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so I'm interested in how we can find out about past food consumption. And I'm currently doing a postdoc uh, in Professor Maria Ivanova Beek's group, HEBA, which is part of VS. Very basically, I'm studying agricultural practices using stabilized top ratios. We've all heard that you are what you eat, so your skeleton reflects what you've eaten with some alterations. And we can make use of this by analyzing bones and teeth to find out about past diets. And the most common way in archaeology to do this, Katarina already mentioned it, is using carbon and nitrogen stabilized top ratios. They're typically displayed like this, with uh, carbon stabilized top ratios on the horizontal axis and nitrogen on the other one. And different plants have different carbonized top ratios because of different photosynthetic pathways and also carbon sources. So, for example, wheat has a much lower stable carbonized top ratio than maize. Consumers of plants will have slightly higher nitrogen and carbon stabilized top ratios than their food. So, a sheep consuming wheat would plot slightly above its diet, and by comparison, an alpaca consuming maize would have a higher carbonized top ratio than the sheep. And a wolf that eats the sheep would have a higher nitrogen isotope ratio than the sheep. So some of the questions we can address with this is things like were pigs fed slaughter waste or possibly kept close by in the village or were they kept in forests? Were there specialized animal husbandry regimes? For example, when there are poo calving periods, this has implications for milk provision. Uh, and we looked at several other aspects. Very important for this is that we need modern reference material because isotope ratios are affected by many different factors and they can also vary between different climates. So without modern reference data, we don't really know what the numbers mean. Uh, I did my PhD on the Orkney Islands in Scotland and I studied seaweed eating sheep. So why are there seaweed eating sheep? Well, seaweed eating is an adaptation to the Northern Ireland environment. There's a short growing season, a scarcity of land, the Orkney Islands were very wet and windy, so storing hay is quite difficult. Seaweed's available and present day animals like eating it. So we wanted to understand more about how and when and why these adaptations occurred and how this affected people's survival as well. So we took samples from present day sheep bones and teeth and terrestrial vegetation and seaweed from the Orkney Islands to get reference data of what seaweed consumption looks like in bone collagen and also in teeth. When we're looking at the plant uh, isotope ratios. From uh, two islands, we've got terrestrial vegetation. You can see that the carbon isotope ratio is, as expected, much lower than for seaweed, which is shown on the right. When we look at bones, at bone collagen, stable isotope ratios from seaweed eating and terrestrial feeding sheep, we see the same pattern. So the sheep consuming terrestrial diets, which are in green, had much lower carbon isotope ratios than seaweed eating sheep, and mixed diets are somewhere in between. So this is great news for us. We can tell how much seaweed was being consumed. Uh, and so we analyzed 17 sheep and three deer from the Ness of Brodka. This is a multi-phase site, mostly late Neolithic, spanning around two and a half hectares on the Orkney Islands. And we found that several sheep consumed seaweed around uh, 4,500 years ago. Uh, this is currently under review. But actually we can do much more than that because by taking multiple samples from the same tooth, we can look at at what time during tooth formation seaweed was consumed. So shown here in pink is a reference sheep that consumed seaweed in winter and terrestrial foods in summer. And this is also a pattern that we found at the Ness of Brodka, where in winter seaweed was being consumed. In addition, we can also look at oxygen stabilized up ratios uh, with which we can study birth seasonality. So oxygen stabilized up ratios in temperate climates vary cyclically with temperature. So we can compare the position of the peak in oxygen isotope ratios with reference data to tell us about the time of the year that an animal was likely born. And again, this has implications for dairying, for example. But if we move on from animals to plants, and I'm sticking with seaweed again, uh, I also wanted to look at how fertilization of terrestrial crops can affect crop isotope ratios. So how does fertilization with with seaweed affect the composition of the crop? Uh, and how does this affect how we interpret dietary studies? So for this, I did a field trial on the Orkney Islands where we fertilized a field of bear barley, which is an old barley land race, which is still cultivated on the Orkney Islands, with seaweed. And we followed traditional ways of using seaweed as a fertilizer, 
based on what I found in historical documents. The results of this were very promising. Um, you can see here the effect of fertilization on the left. So fertilization greatly increased the size of the barley plants. So at this point, we already knew the fertilization part of the study at least worked. And then we analyzed them for various isotope ratios. And we did find significant differences in the isotopic and chemical composition of the crops with nitrogen stable isotope ratios uh, being significantly higher in grains, husks and straw. So this means that we need to take seaweed fertilization effects into account when interpreting data, for example, of humans that consumed uh, barley. So we can also analyze archaeological remains directly to investigate extent of fertilization. This could also be from animal dung, also water status, so how well irrigated plants were. And we also use this to, to get baseline data for dietary reconstructions. The project I'm currently working on is uh, in Maria Ivanova speak Heba. Uh, and we're looking at the spread of farming, the initial sp spread of farming. So we're looking at uh, adaptations to new environments when you're taking animals and plants out of the, the area where they were first domesticated, um, how, what adaptations were, were necessary. Uh, we are doing this in a lab in Utsagatswai, which you're very welcome to visit, and some people already did visit, uh, where we're doing bone collagen extraction, sequential enamel sampling and pretreatment, and also pretreatment of cereal and grains and pulses for later analysis by us to pressure uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, and yeah, we're, we would also be happy to collaborate with further people, and uh, we're also taking in master's students and PhD students um, who would like to do these things in the lab. Um, that's it. Thanks very much.